by day, day by day. Oh, dear Lord, three things I pray. See Thee more clearly, love Thee more dearly, follow Thee. Good morning. I'm David Hall, one of the pastors here at Christ Church. Welcome to our worship service. It's so good to be able to praise and worship God today. We have been approved to open for worship next Sunday, June 21st. We're extremely excited about that, and yet we want to be really, really sure that we are prepared. We think we are. We're going to be continuing to live stream. We uh, have put together a new poll. Some of you have taken it already, some of you have not, and we'd ask that you please do that. The whole purpose of the poll is to find out which worship service that you will be in next Sunday, or if you plan to continue to live stream with us. We did a first poll about three weeks ago. This new one adds the new worship services to it. Remember, we'll be worshiping at 9.30, at 11.15, and then at 1 p.m., so please make your choice. It takes about 20 seconds to do that survey. Please do it today before midnight tonight. That's the absolute deadline. I'm sure you've already seen our video, but we want to kind of review a few things to make sure you know exactly what to expect when you do come to worship. First of all, even as you're in the parking lot, please maintain that six-foot safe distance. You must wear your mask at all times while you're in the building. A hospitality team member will help you to, to uh, will direct you to your seats with spacing to make sure that we maintain safe distancing. As required by the health department for contact tracing in case someone does pos test positive among us, we must have the household name and phone numbers and something that will really help us with our seating process. Before you leave home, if you would, just take an index card or a small piece of paper Write your names, everyone who will be with you, and a phone number for you. Bring that with you when you come. 
When the service is over, we will be dismissed by rows, and that is going to take just a little bit of time, but our musicians will continue to play so that we can enjoy that time. Our services will be 45 minutes, so we'll have plenty of time. Please, please be patient with us as we work through this. Every bit of this, all of this is being done because we care for you, and we want to make sure we keep you safe and well. Finally, coming in July is something we're calling our churchwide Summer Bible Challenge. You're going to hear more about that next Sunday. We really, really look forward to that. Thank you. The Word of God tells us, let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. And if you are breathing this morning, we ask you to join in with us and let us give God praise this morning. Come on, everybody, put your hands together. Come on and say it with me. Every praise. Every praise Come on. is to our God. Every word of Every worship. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise is to our God. Is to our Bye.
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing it. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every life, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every scripture reading today is from the Genesis chapter 25. I'll begin reading at verse 19. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean, from Paden Aram, and sister of Laban the Aramean. 
Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Greetings, Christ Church friends. This is a place I come to when the troubles of this world seem so great, and I need to remember again that God is so much greater. Let us pray. God of hope and faithfulness, in this season and life, the trouble seems so great. The global pandemic, the economic woes, the tornado, the need for reconciliation across our land. We need you, O oh God, and we realize in these moments our finiteness, and we need to remember again your infinite grace and goodness and kindness and mercy unto us all. We need you, O oh God, to teach our hearts new things about living through these seasons and waiting on you and trusting you and trusting you for your provisions and also trusting you to lead us and guide us in ways of reconciliation. O oh God, change our hearts, work your new work in our lives so that we again are birthed to a new creation so that your will on earth is the same as your will in heaven. O oh God, we pray this day for those who need you in special and particular ways, for those who need your healing, for those who need your comfort and peace and renewed strength. And we pray this day for Pastor Nathan as he brings the message to us from Jacob. Of the stories of Jacob's life, that we may learn lessons from Jacob, of your healing and reconciliation in our lives as well. And O oh God, we pray that we may be the church you called us to be in all the places that we go. We pray together now the prayer you continue to teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how He picked me up and turned me around, how He placed my feet. Solid ground, it makes me want to shout. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise. It makes me want to shout. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise. When 
Last week I started a sermon series focused on four Old Testament characters that I believe most influenced the story of God's people in the time before Jesus came to earth. We're calling it the Mount Rushmore of the Old Testament. And we're looking to glean lessons for our lives from the lives of Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and David. So today we focus on Jacob. Jacob, uh, his father Isaac, and his father Abraham are commonly referred to as the patriarchs. It was the 12 sons of Jacob who, whose namesakes and families went on to become the 12 tribes of Israel. So these three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were the three foundational fathers, if you will, who, who were there before the time those tribes were established. After that, when God would speak to somebody, often as a way of introduction almost, God would say, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Interestingly, Genesis doesn't give us much about Isaac. There's not many chapters in the, the line of the story, but we got a lot of chapters about Jacob. And so we're skipping skipping a generation as we move from Abraham to Jacob today. Now, I have to say up front that for somebody to be so important in the story of the people of God, Jacob did not have a good reputation. He, his, his reputation, it, it started early in his life, and it continued most all of his life as his family told about him. He was known as a deceiver throughout the family. Uh, part of the meaning of the name Jacob is deceiver. Uh, you had to keep an eye on this guy. He, 
He knew how to trick you, take your stuff. Well, as his family told about him, this reputation of his started all the way back when he was born. In fact, it was before he was born. He had a twin brother, as you heard. Uh, Esau was born first. There would have been midwives there to assist Rebekah as she gave birth to these boys. So as they told about what happened, they said that when the first baby came out, that the little hand of the second baby, one of the little hands of the second baby was holding on to the heel of the first baby. One of the other meanings of the name Jacob is he who grasps the heel. Rebecca wasn't totally surprised about what they said. In fact, she said that even weeks before, it felt like these boys were wrestling inside of her, and, and she wondered what that was all about. She even went to God to ask God about it. What's going on here? And, and you heard in the reading God's reply. As they grew up, they continued to wrestle. Even though they were twins, it was amazing how different they were. Esau was an outdoorsman. He, he loved to go hunting. Jacob tended to hang around the tent most of the time. And he was a good cook. He learned to cook. I mentioned both of those because there's a significant, significant part of the story where one day Esau came in from hunting and he was as hungry as he'd ever been in his life. Jacob had just fixed up a big old pot of stew. I mean, it smelled so good. Esau wanted some. And Jacob saw an opportunity. He'd been probably been thinking his whole life that he should have had that birthright that goes to the firstborn son. It was part of that culture. And it was significant. And, and so he said to Esau, you don't get any stew unless you give me your birthright. And amazingly, Esau agreed to it. He, he gave it away. So the first lesson that I'm gleaning out of Jacob's life actually is more focused on Esau, and here it is. Don't give away your future to satisfy a present desire. That birthright was worth a double portion of the father's inheritance. That would have had a significant impact on his future, on the future of his family, and yet he gave it away simply because he was hungry. It's an important life lesson for all of us. Parents will sometimes, will often impress this lesson on their teenagers, on their young adult children, and yet it's not just for teenagers and young adults. It's, for, it's a life lesson for all of us at any age. You can give away your future seeking pleasure. You can give away your future in an act of violence. Maybe just out of anger or revenge. But then again, sometimes acts of violence are motivated from a sense of hopelessness. A sense of not feeling like you have much of a future. Sometimes people who are poor, people who are abused, people who for whatever reason will, will throw away their future out of a sense of hopelessness about the future in an act of violence. And then there are those who give away their future in debt or burden their future at least in debt. They, they buy too much on credit. They mortgage their future on too much of a house or too much of a car or too much of whatever else more than they can afford. I just had to have it right now. I couldn't wait, they say. Don't, don't give away your future to satisfy a present desire. Sometime later, Jacob did something that sealed his reputation as a deceiver. I, I wonder if, if all that other stuff from earlier in his life would, would have even been talked about if he hadn't done this thing. He lied to his dad. He, he deceived him so much that Isaac gave him 
the, the blessing that was supposed to go to Esau. That was another part of the culture, another part of the understanding and belief of that time. It was very significant. And Isaac was in his last days. He, he was almost totally blind. Jacob's mother instigated this plot. Now, he went along with it after some initial resistance. He very much went along with it. And you can read the details about it in Genesis chapter 27. But the fact is that that Jacob blatantly lied to his dad because when he came in as a part of this deception, when he first came in, Isaac could tell there there was something wasn't right. That voice didn't sound like Esau's. And so he asked, who is this? And Jacob said, I am Esau, your firstborn. His father gave him the blessing. When Esau came in and found out about it, what are some of those phrases you've heard? Some of the phrases I've heard, he was fit to be tied. He was madder than a wet hen. Whatever phrases you've heard for people who were really mad, he was really mad. He was so mad, he vowed to kill his brother. Out of this one act of deception, Jacob had to leave his family. Lesson two from Jacob's life. Sin destroys relationships. And I can put that in even, not just three words, I can put it down into two words. Sin separates. Jacob deeply hurt his relationship with both his brother and his father, so much so that he had to separate from both of them. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from other people. Most of the Ten Commandments warn us about sins that will harm our lives. And and they're all about our relationships. Our relationship with God, our relationship with people. God made you for relationship. And these commandments tell you how to live your life so as not to harm yourself and your relationships. Well, Rebecca is told about Esau's vow to kill his brother, and so she goes to Isaac and she convinces him that they need to send him away, send Jacob away to spend time with her brother Laban. Another part of that culture and time was that it was okay to marry within the family, or at least the extended family, and they didn't want him to marry a Canaanite woman, and and so Isaac said, you need to go spend time with your brother, with Uncle Laban, and find there a wife for yourself among his family. So he was sent away to Laban. On his way, on the trip, we get this side story about a time one night he he laid his head down on a rock and he had a dream. He went to sleep, had a dream. He dreamed of a ladder. Uh, Some interpretations of it say it was a a stairway or or even a ramp. But I remember growing up hearing it was a ladder. It it started on earth, went all the way to heaven. I I remember as a boy in vacation Bible school learning that song about Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. And as a part of that dream, God said to Jacob, he said that the covenant that had been started with Abraham, that had continued through Isaac, would now continue through him. Well, with that in mind, he continues the journey. He finds, uh, he, he finds where Uncle Laban is, and he discovers there that Laban has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. He, he met Rachel first, and she was beautiful. He fell in love with her. Another part of that culture was that uh, the man was to have some kind of a dowry, some, some goods to offer to the father of a daughter in order to get to marry her, and he didn't have anything. And so he negotiated with his uncle, and and they agreed that he would work seven years in order to get to marry Rachel. Well, he was a good worker. He he worked his seven years. They went by, and then it came time for the wedding. Well, here's where the deceiver got deceived. The taker got taken, if you will. Without going into details, uh, Laban tricked Jacob into taking Leah as his wife. And when Jacob realized what had happened, he was angry. And 
Another part of the culture was that it was okay to have more than one wife, and so he still wanted to marry Rachel, and so he again negotiated with his uncle, and he agreed that he would work seven more years in order to marry Rachel. Just as Jacob had deceived his father, deceived somebody close to him, now Laban had deceived him. Let's take note of another lesson. How you treat others will often be done to you as well. Jacob had lived his life deceiving even those close to him. And now, at a most important moment in his life, somebody close to him had deceived him. It's a good reminder to all of us, often you get what you give. If you're kind to other people, most of the time they're going to be kind to you. If you're generous with other people, chances are they're going to give generously to you. But it works the other way. On the other hand, if you're always angry, if you're always going around angry, spewing words and actions of hate, chances are that's going to come back on you. And I can put, I can put that even more bluntly. If you go out in life looking for a fight, be assured that there are people out there ready to fight. It amazes me how many people seem to be looking for a fight in life, and yet then when they're surprised when people want to fight. Jesus put this life lesson in a much more positive way, he kind of turned it around, and he put it in a, in a rule that we call golden. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Here we have this life lesson that lets us know that, that people are going to treat us how we treat them quite often. And that much of the time that's how we do with others. And Jesus turned that around and said, if you're going to be mine, I want you to live differently than that. Don't just treat people how they treat you. Do to others how you would want them to do to you, no matter how they treat you. Well, as the story of Jacob continues, we're told that he had 12 sons, one daughter, that he spent more time, as several years, he stayed with Uncle Laban. And um, there was more deception and intrigue, and you could read about that uh, there in Genesis. But at one point, God tells Jacob it's time to go back home, time to go back to his homeland. And he knows that means he's going to have to confront Esau. There's more uh, very dramatic parts of the story there. You can read about those in chapters 32 and 33 in Genesis. Esau had not forgotten his vow to kill his brother, and when he heard that his brother was headed home, he headed out right then to go meet him, and he had 400 men with him. This does not look good for Jacob. The night before they were supposed to meet, Jacob had sent his family and his servants and his animals, everything on ahead. He was all by himself. And all of a sudden, sometime during the night, this man shows up and engages him in a wrestling match. Turns out that man was God who gave Jacob a new name, Israel. It means one who wrestles with God. He also came out with a limp. Here's our lesson. God wants to wrestle you. God wants to wrestle you. And if you're willing, you will be changed. No matter who you are, God wants to show you a better way of living your life. God still has lessons for you to learn. God wants to to see you continue to grow in wisdom and understanding, to be able to live life at its best. But that means you'll need to change from the way you are and who you are now. And for most of us, we resist change. When when God engages us in this wrestling match, this battle to change, we tend to want to get away. We don't want any part of that. But Jacob was different. Jacob, the Bible says, Jacob latched on. He wouldn't let go. Jacob wanted a a deeper relationship with God, and so he's forever known as the one who wrestled with God. 
Israel. We have a heritage, an ancestry. Part of our story is the people who are willing to wrestle with God. He came out of that wrestling match a different man. He had a new name. He had a limp. I believe that limp had a lot to do with how his brother saw him when they finally met. It, he, was, he was bowing to his brother. He wasn't there to confront him. And it ended up that Esau forgave him. And in the midst of that encounter, in the midst of that act of reconciliation, Jacob said it was like seeing God. He experienced God's presence in that act of reconciliation. God's all about that. The focus of the rest of the story of the life of Jacob is on him being the father of these 12 sons. They are the first who become known as the children of Israel. He had a favorite among his sons, Joseph. Uh, that caused all kinds of dysfunction in the family. It is kind of interesting to me that he had experienced favoritism early in his life in the family, and yet he didn't learn from that experience, and he carried that into the next generation, as we all so often do. We all carry things from past generations with us into the next generation. Some of that's good, and some of it's not so good. Once more, his life of deception came back on him. Just as he had done with his father, his sons lied to him. They showed up one day with this coat of many colors. Had all kinds of blood stains all over it. And they told dad that a wild animal had killed his favorite son, Joseph. When in fact, they had sold Joseph to slave traders. So Jacob, in that moment, experienced, he, he suffered some of the deepest grief known to humans, the death of a child, no matter the age. Another lesson from Jacob's life here, and I, and I a pun intended, I wrestled with how to put this, but here's what I came up with. Where possible, make amends for past sins and teaching. Two of the 12 steps in the recovery process with Alcoholics Anonymous and other similar recovery programs deal with this issue of making amends with people that you've heard in the past. This life lesson includes that. It's about that, but it's about more than that. It's, it's about how that we all, uh, at times in our past, we've set a bad example. We've done things wrong. We've taught those around us badly by things we've said, by things we've done, whether it was our children, whether it was our other family members, whether it was friends or, or whoever, we've done things wrong, said things wrong, acted in, in ways and had attitudes that were bad examples. I, I called my children the other day as I was working on this. I said, you know, I, I, if I'm going to talk about this, I need, to, I need to do this. And so I called them and I said, I know I've mentioned this some before, but I just wanted to say it again. I wanted to be very specific and clear that sometimes I set a bad example for you. And I gave them two quick examples that they've heard me mention before. I said, particularly those times when I yelled too often at referees at ball games, and, and those times that I was too impatient and I expressed my impatience to drivers on the road, I was wrong. That's bad behavior. And I hope somehow you can overcome my bad example. I think we all, if we're real honest with ourselves, we know of those situations in our past, those attitudes, those beliefs, those ways of thinking that we had in our past that were wrong. And we need to go back where we can. We can't do that with everybody. It's not possible in all situations, but where it is possible, we need to go back and say, I just want you to know I set a bad example there, and, and I hope you can overcome that. But I wanted to acknowledge it. Jacob's story has a good ending. During the midst of a famine, he sent his sons down to Egypt. He heard that they had plenty of food down in Egypt, and so he sent his sons down there to get food. And it's another dramatic part of a series of events and uh, 
the story, part of the story, you can read about that. But in the midst of that, he gets good news. That son that he thought was dead, he finds out that not only is he alive, but he's a prominent leader there in Egypt. And he has this wonderful reunion with Joseph. He gets to live the remaining years of his life there in Egypt with all of his family around him. So after looking at the life of Jacob, here's a final lesson of good news. You can develop a new reputation. You can be a different person. You can change. When you sign on for a relationship with Jesus Christ, God forgives you of your sin, cleanses you of your past. But God also begins to teach you how to live life in a whole new way, how to, how to relate to people in a whole new way. God teaches you how to, how to, to deal with the past. Uh, this Holy Spirit teaches you how to deal with the past. This Holy Spirit teaches you how to move into a future of hope and joy and peace. Let's put it this way. In memory of the one who wrestled with God, I invite you to allow God to wrestle out of you the changes that you need to make so that you can live life at its best and you can help other people come to know God through Jesus Christ because you've wrestled with God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Oh God, we give you thanks that you're willing to wrestle with us. You're willing to engage us. You care so much about us that, that you, you know of things that need to change in our lives and you're willing to engage us in sometimes hard conversations, hard reminders, hard things to deal with so that we might become the people you've called us to be, that you want to create us to be. Lord, continue to give us the courage. Give us courage to stay in that wrestling match, to be willing to change so that we might be the people you want us to be and others might come to know you through our example. In Jesus' name, amen. You all have been so faithful in downloading the church app so that you could register your attendance on Sunday morning. Please do that now. And if you have a prayer request or a special need, please put that in the notes section. During this next song, it's going to be a beautiful offertory. And while you, we're hearing that, it's a wonderful time for you to make your, your offering for the day, whether it's online do, uh, through the donations or whether it's writing a check. I encourage you to do that right now.
relationship with this God, this God who cares enough about you to engage you in a wrestling match, to want to wrestle out of you all that needs to change, to create you new so that you can live life at its best. And God did that most fully for all of us in coming to us through Jesus who came to this earth to, to wrestle out of this world the sins of this world and invite you into a personal relationship so that you can know this new life. If you've not done that yet, please contact us. Let us know. Let us help you get that relationship started. If you've not found a church to unite with and mission and ministry, we welcome you here at Christ Church. Email us. Give us a call. We'd love to help you get connected in this congregation. This next song says that is a prayer to God, a, a prayer of celebration, a prayer of thanksgiving that God is always faithful. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. Shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest thoughts thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be.
it is our prayer that all of the songs you've heard today, all of the prayers you've heard prayed, the sermon you've heard, the lessons from the life of Jacob, we've offered all those to God in worship. But we also believe God uses those to speak into our lives. Take these with you. Let them help you and guide you to be the people of Christ. Amen.